Good morning, church family. Morning. We're gathered together as a family this morning, aren't we? And uh, as people of faith, we know that we're not immune from life, illness, storms of life. And, uh, but we do draw on the strength of our Lord and Saviour through these difficult times. Sadly, most of us will know, but in case you don't, Lynette Bryant sadly lost her life yesterday to what seems a very short illness, very rapid in the end. And we'll all have different ways in which we grieve and we mourn. And there's no right or wrong way. You've just got to be you and, and not be something for somebody else. We can strengthen one another. We're here to encourage one another. That's what family does at times. A tragedy like this, it's raw, it's going to be a shock. But I do know, if Lynette was here and able to speak, she would tell us to praise our God, the God in which she loved, the God in which she served wholeheartedly and committed her life to in this place to serve this church. She would encourage us to raise our hands. And praise him, the Lord and Saviour, this morning. Our prayers are now for John, Ryan, Luke, Ben, the family, for Lorraine, Lynette's sister. And we need to pray for them, for peace at this time, for strength, the things of the kingdom of God, to lift them up before him, to be sensitive, but also to be there when called upon to strengthen one another. So, we might feel downbeat this morning, but I believe the net would want us to be upbeat. Very sad day. I've had a, a day to process this, and it's hard. It's not easy. There's no flippant answers. There's no straightforward scriptures that you can use but what I want to do is read one of my favorite scriptures in my times of storm and believe you me this is a storm for me and it's from Isaiah 41 10 do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your Lord your God I will strengthen you and I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We need to draw on the depth of our faith at such a difficult time. Be there for one another. Be there for the family at such a tragic time. But we're going to praise God. We're going to lift our hands to God. Because if Lynette was here, she'd be telling us to do exactly that. Because she lived it through and through. And as her favorite song goes, she's tethered to the cross right so Lord we want to just pray as we start our service this morning Lord God it is difficult but we thank you for a life lived thank you for a life of service and dedication to you this morning Lord God as we lift Lynette and the family John Ryan Luke and Ben Lorraine before you this morning Pray your strength, your peace, and your the passion of the love of Christ to be with them this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Should we stand up if we can? We're gonna worship the Lord together. Wanna, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I 
just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I see Jesus declare it together your name is power your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is power Your name your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shine Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Shout Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness Over every enemy Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus, your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is power. Come on, if you believe that, let's declare. He brings every stronghold. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Your name is power. Because your name is power. Why don't we just lift up our voices in worship to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. Jesus, we fix our eyes unto this morning, Lord. For you are worthy of it all. How 
how great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the then through the darkness, your loving kindness, so through the shadows of my soul, the work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. Could imagine who could imagine so great a mercy? One heart could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages set down from glory to where my sin and bear. spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living Lord. hallelujah hallelujah Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the rain. Come on, cheers, let's declare the king. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the great has no claim on me. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Your is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Jesus Christ, Jesus 
of a hymn this morning and I just wanted to share it with you it might help you too if it's helped me it's oh safe to the rock that is higher than I my soul in its conflict and sorrow would fly in the tempests of life on its wide heaving sea thou blessed rock of ages I'm hiding in thee that's where I want to be. I want to be hiding in him. It's the best place. Amen. Jesus. You know, we're reminded in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Then he goes on to say, in this world you will have trouble. But I love this verse. He says, take heart. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, when Jesus says, take heart, what he's saying is, keep trusting in me. When he says, take heart, he keeps saying, says, come on, keep pressing on, keep journeying with me. Keep trusting in me, keep hoping in me. We just sang that song, that worship song about living hope, Christ being our living hope. You know, and when I look at that word living hope, I think about three different things. And that word living hope for me, it comes in threefold. Past, present, and future. You know, in, from the very beginning, before even I was born, he was with me. Before even you were born, he was with you. Psalmist writes it wonderfully in the Psalms. Before you created in your mother's womb, I knew you. You know, so Jesus, from the very beginning, he knew us. That was our living hope. From the very beginning, he had plans and purposes for our life. From the very beginning, even though the enemy tried to still rob and take away our joy, Jesus was always there with us from the very beginning. Then, then that brings us to the present reality, our living hope today. You know, you might have a lot of, you might be carrying a lot of pain right now and you might, you, you might be devastated by the news. But, you know, we have this living hope in Jesus. And, you know, that living hope sets us free. That living hope gives us the strength to carry on. That living hope gives us the assurance that because of him, we can face tomorrow. Because of Jesus, there is always a living hope. See, I've said this before, but your current condition is not your conclusion. You know, the current situation, this is in the end. This is in the, uh, this is in the conclusion. Jesus is with us. You know, and right now, this difficult time, you know, Jesus is with the family. You know, the family are hurting right now with the news, with the loss. But our hope in Jesus is that Jesus is here with us, comforting us. But at the same time, Jesus is with the family, comforting them. Jesus is our hope. He's our comfort. And that brings me to my third one, future. Jesus, because of Jesus, tomorrow can be different because of Jesus, whatever we're going through right now, tomorrow can be different. You know, and Paul writes it wonderfully in Romans 8, 28. He makes everything work together for the good of those who trust in him. And Paul also writes wonderfully in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. We don't always understand why, but we know he is in control. You know, and that's our biggest job should i say our biggest responsibility right now we have to trust god we have to continue to trust god regardless of whatever storms that come our way we have to continue to trust god regardless of whatever the situation we have to continue to trust god because of jesus there is hope because of jesus there is a future because of jesus we have this life and it just does not end here there's this eternal life and so let's rejoice in that you know we know where our loved ones are right now, those who trusted in God. And we know 
where Lynette is right now because she chose to trust in Jesus. And isn't that this assuring hope that we've got? Doesn't that bring us comfort and peace? We know where she is and she's rejoicing. She's rejoicing with the Lord. Amen. She's rejoicing with the Lord. So we're going to sing this next worship song. And as we sing this next worship song, we're going to collect up our offering as well. The stewards are going to come around with the basket. And let's continue to worship Jesus. You know, in spite of whatever times we go through, let's continue to trust in him. Let's continue to worship Jesus because he's our living hope. Amen. Can move the mountains, let the mountains move. Come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation, still in all my heart. The author of salvation, you've loved us from the start. Waiting here for you, with our hands lifted. It's you, we adore, sing hallelujah. You are everything. You are everything you promised. Your faithfulness is true. We're desperate for your presence. All we need is you. We're waiting here. We're waiting here for you. With our hands lifted. And it's you we adore, singing hallelujah, singing hallelujah. I'm going to 
going to ask us to do something. Matter of fact, I'm going to encourage us to do something right now. As an act of worship, as an expression of worship. If you can, come on, why don't we lift up both of your hands to the heavens right now. As an expression of trust. As an act of trust. As a declaration of trust. Declaring in the heavens that, Lord, we continue to trust in you. Lord, we don't understand everything, but we continue to trust in you. We continue to trust in your word. We continue to trust in your promises. We continue to trust in your guidance. We continue to trust in you. Sing those words together. We're waiting here for you. With our hands lifted high in praise, and it's you we adore, singing One more time, just the voices. We're waiting here for you. Right to be here with our hands lifted high. Thank you, Lord, for your presence within us, within this room. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in each and every life. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of your spirit into our lives. Wherever we're at this morning, Lord God, I know that you love us, each and every one of us. Whatever thoughts we might have, God's big enough to take that. God just wants honesty. I just want to lift my hands to you, Lord God, this morning for your strength and your power. For the inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the cross. Through the resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Move amongst us, Lord God. Minister to your people. Minister to your people, Lord. Help them in their point of need. You know every individual need this morning, Lord. Touch them. Be with them. Minister to them, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ian's just uh, came to me. Just wanted to share a little something. My condolences and the condolences of my family to Lynette's family. I too was shocked, shocked. And this morning I, um, I looked for what I thought was a poem. And it turns out it's a hymn. I've never sung this hymn. I only remember the words from many, many years ago. But I just felt it was appropriate to read these this morning. God has not promised skies always blue. Flowers strewn pathways all our life through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God has promised strength for the day, less rest for the labourer, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, Unfailing sympathy, undying love. God has not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He has not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. God has not promised smooth roads and wide, swift, easy travel, 
needing no guide, never a mountain rocky and steep, never a river turbid and deep, but God has promised. But God has promised. Strength for the day, rest for the laborer, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. Amen. Thank you, Ian. Great words. Great words. Thank you so much for bringing that to us this morning. Well, we have a guest speaker with us this morning. Most of you know John and Kathy, but let's give them a, a warm show of Forest Community Church welcome. It's great to see you both with us. Uh, from Talbot Street to Carton Community Church to redeployment. <laughs> he, he didn't like the word retirement. No, I'm not but just so great to be on the journey with you, John. Thank you, Thank you for, so much for you and Kathy's input into our lives and uh, into the life of this church over many years. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Bless you, mate. It really is a tremendous joy uh, on such a sad day, really, but a tremendous joy to be with you today and to have the honor privilege of uh, speaking the Bible to you. And uh, I always think of the church around the world. There are many places where today, whatever time zone, people haven't got this lovely building. People are meeting secretly for, uh, for fear of their lives. Some are in prison. Some are separated from their families. But Jesus... Jesus, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is in every cell. He's in every secret meeting. He's in every public meeting. And as a Christian, I am assured that Jesus so loved the church. The church is going to be his bride. And uh, he loves it and uh, is working through the Holy Spirit, even here today. And even though it's a sad day for you today, and it's a sad day for us, I want us to know today that Jesus Christ is with us. He is our living hope. And I remember a time, and I share this with Kathy's permission, 13 years ago, Kathy had cancer. And uh, I remember one of our girls, who's now on a plane somewhere between Dubai and Sydney, going back to the office there in Sydney, at the time, she was walking in London, and I took her to the station. I said, Sarah, I really have no idea how this is going to work out. But I've learned in those times that God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. And I want to say to you today that in my journey of faith over these last 50 years, I was saved at a very, very young age that the disciplines of daily walking with the Lord have helped me and sustained me. I kept going to church, even though things were tough and it was the last place I wanted to be, I kept going. I kept getting up in the mornings, reading the Bible, sitting quietly, speaking loudly to God, speaking in tongues, thanking Him. And I want to encourage you, I didn't turn around today, but when we sing songs about raising our hands, I want to encourage you to actually do it. Do it. Because it's an act of worship. And I remember going to church one Sunday morning. And these kind of things happen in church. I remember in church one Sunday morning. And I'm in the congregation. And someone gave a message in tongues. And the only bit I can remember is this. God's sustaining grace. And something came into me that day that every day there was enough grace to get me through the day. And over this family that is the, what's the phrase I'm looking for, the biological family and the spiritual family, there is sustaining grace. And whatever you're going through in your personal life today, I want you to know there is sustaining grace 
available through our Lord Jesus Christ. We will lay someone to rest on Tuesday morning. Some of you will remember, will remember a man called Cherry Walters. Uh, Cherry, uh, we've known them for, what, 40 years at least, I think, and uh, have served the Lord and served the local church and a great encourager, and Cherry went home to be with the Lord. And I want to say today, I've learned over the years that my times are in God's hands. And I say to people, it's not that we won our battle with cancer and they lost theirs. The fact is, our times are in God's hands. And I believe this with all my heart. Whatever door I go through into eternity, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that my times are in God's hands. I was born right on time, and I will die right on time. Jesus was born right on time, in the fullness of time. God sent his son, and at the right time he died, and at the right time he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. At the right time he will come back again Amen. in glory and splendor. Amen. And this might seem a little bit of a pun, but it really is important. The Christian faith helps us to face the music even when we don't like the tune. And today is not a tune that we like, but we thank God. We have the sure and certain hope of the resurrection from the dead. Listen, you, you can nod, you can say hello, or you can say well done, or amen, or whatever, okay? And I um, forget where I was going, but that's okay. <laughs> It really is a tremendous joy and privilege today to be among you, as I said. And I want us to stand to read the scriptures. Thank God for the book. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll say it in English, okay? <laughs> Thank God for the book. Amen. I wasn't in the city ground yesterday, but when Forest beat West Ham, which was a rare occasion, I'm sure those how many thousand were there, they all shouted. And here we are with this priceless book. So... Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. So if you've got a Bible in your hand or you've got it on your tablet, whatever, please open it and we'll read the Word of God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. It is God breathed. We thank you that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you can speak a sentence into our lives, into our hearts, that can change us, can bring hope, that confident expectation of good because the Lord reigns. And I pray for us here today that we will have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants us to hear. I pray for myself, Lord, as the preacher, having prepared and prayed, I pray for the grace of the Holy Spirit. To help us, even in reading your word publicly. And for those who watch online, we pray in Jesus' name that your word will go and touch them and minister to them, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 1. In the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twelfth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanai, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some older men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my ancestral family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, 
If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Please be seated. The message I want to speak with us this morning has been jumping around inside my heart for a period of time now, and it started off as the person God uses. The person God uses. Now, we know from the Bible that God uses all sorts of people who are not particularly perfect, but they've got a heart for God. When God used David, we know David, the Bible says, and this is God's record about David, with all his imperfections, David was a man after God's own heart. Now, we know he made some big mistakes, but when he realized he made mistakes, he repented and sought forgiveness from God. But I also want to talk about the signs of, of revival because, can we have the next slide, please? I'd rather, okay, you just listen to me and follow me, okay? There we go. What we've read about today in Nehemiah chapter 1 is the final of four great movements of the Holy Spirit. And after... Uh, and then after uh, the book of Nehemiah, the book of Haggai, but here we have, sorry, uh, Malachi, as a prophet, I mean, the Malachi. So here we have four great moves of God. This is where God comes among his people and begins to manifest himself. I don't know if you know, but there are three kind of dimensions to the presence of God. There is the essence of his presence, which means God is everywhere. God is even in the pub, because he fills the whole earth with his glory. And then there's what's called the manifest presence of God. That is where God makes himself known. And uh, for me, 50 years ago, in a little council house on the south side of Cox City, in my bedroom, having met some Christians, God made himself known. He was always in the bedroom. God is everywhere. Do we believe that? Yeah. Everywhere. That's who he is. He fills the whole earth with his presence. But in that moment, God made himself known. And I knelt by the side of my bed, and I received Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I've never recovered. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. And then there's also what I would call the maintenance of the presence of God. It's how we live our lives so we develop our awareness of him, so I can experience him wherever I am. Remember... Jacob said, God was in this place, and I never knew it. And even more scary, Samson did not realize that God had left him. And I want to encourage you as a congregation today to develop, to maintain the presence of God in your life. Hallelujah. How do we do that? Well, simply by every day building into our lives time where we spend with God. You can stop at the traffic lights and have a moment. Not one of those moments, but you can have a moment where you can just pause and think about God. Instead of getting angry, now I have to learn that, but instead of getting irate and angry, just thank God. I want to thank you today for your love and your mercy, for your kindness, for the fact that Jesus loves me. And <clears throat> this is a divine opportunity. So these are Ezra chapter 1, verse 6. Sorry, chapter 1 to chapter 6 is the first return on Zerubbabel. And then, this is the scary bit. If you didn't go in that move of God, you'd have to wait 58 more years before the opportunity would come again. And then there's a second return under Ezra. And then, in that period of time, in the first one, after about three or four years, they encountered difficulty and opposition. 
And this work of God that they started, and I'll talk about the four emphasis, stopped for about 16 or 17 years. And you can read about it in Haggai. And in that time, the people focused on themselves, and they focused on building their lovely houses. And the message through Haggai is, is it right for you to be living in such a palatial structure and God's house is in a ruin? And they, they stirred him up. And the people were saying, well, the time hasn't come yet. Friends, this is the day to get involved in the work of God. So when, when God began to stir the hearts of the people in Ezra chapter 1, and that mission, that revival, that interest that God put in their hearts, because the Bible says God stirred the hearts of Cyrus, and God stirred the heart of the family heads. People were moved on by God, having been living 70 years in a foreign country. Suddenly, God turns up and stirs their hearts, and they go on this amazing eight or 900 mile journey to rebuild the house of God. And here, in this first section of this first revival and this first movement, is based upon worship. Because they go back to reestablish the house of God, but the place they start is in the, they start to rebuild the altar. And they start to offer sacrifices and sing songs they hadn't done for a long time. Because it, you remember, it's a Psalm 137 or 138, they said, it says we hung up our harps and we couldn't sing God's song. And I want to say to you that when the Spirit of God is at work in our lives, we know it's a sign of God reviving us because we start to sing His songs again. Hello? Some of us have lost the habit of singing our own songs to God, of picking a psalm and singing it to God. Maybe it's time today to take your harp down from the willow tree and begin again to build your altar. And remember, they went back to a city whose walls were broken down, and for at least 70 years, it was just devastation. In fact, if you read the story in, uh, in I think, 2 Kings 24 and, and 1 Chronicles 31, it was only the poorest of the poor were left behind. And, uh, and here they go back, and in the midst of all that mess and overgrown fields, there's a site for an altar. And we can tell the Spirit of God is at work in our lives when we again find a new release of worship. We start to get back to the altar and back to the place. What I mean by that is this, that we begin to build something in our lives, a discipline where we worship God again. And remember, <coughs> in between, uh, go back about five, five, I forget the time, but in between that time, between uh, the gap there, there is Haggai starts to prophesy. And he says, it's time for work. So there's worship and, and work. I believe, listen, the only place you'll ever find success before work is in the dictionary. And if you're going to be a strong Christian, if you're going to build something in your life, you've got to work at it. The Bible says we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's God who works in us. Paul said to Timothy, do your best. Do your best. And we can tell when God is at work, because people start to, get, again, start to work at their spirituality. They start to work in the church. The church cannot operate properly without your help. Hello? Without your help. And then this, uh, the second return would happen under Ezra. And you know, Ezra gave his whole life. Even before he went on that journey, he gave his whole life to study the Word of God and to teach his laws and decrees. In Israel. And so here's another revival about the Word of God. It's centered around the Word of God. People would stand for hours and hours as they expounded the Scriptures. And I think that's a great sign of what God, of when God is at work. We start to again fall in love with this book. And you know what? It's not so much about getting through the Bible, it's about getting the Bible through you. I've been reading this book now for 50 years, and when I went to the Christian Center all those years ago, it was called Central Pentecostal Church. Anybody remember when it was called Central Pentecostal Church? Did you raise your hand? Are you that old? <laughs> but I went there as a relatively young Christian. A relatively young Christian, and I said to E.J. Sherman, who was quite a scary bloke, really, and I said, 
I, he gave me permission to call him Pop, and he, I said, Pop, how can I really get a better understanding of the Bible? And he gave me the Bible reading plan that I've used for the last 45 years. Now, there are days, and this is what I want to say, Bible reading plans are great. They're great servants, but they're terrible masters. So when the Scriptures come alive to us, then maybe the Spirit of God wants us to just ponder. I've been in a, a chapter of the Bible now for the last three or four weeks, and that's all I'm reading and praying, because it's got hold of me. And uh, we need to find adventure and romance again in the Holy Scriptures. And uh, it's a sign that God is at work when we start to, again, read the Word and alter our life according to the Word of God. Because they were in a terrible mess, and the walls were broken down because they refused to live according to the Word of God. And then there's a final one with Nehemiah, which is the fourth great move of God uh, before there's that 400 year silence before Jesus the Messiah comes. And uh, Nehemiah would talk to people about rebuilding the walls, because walls are very important. Because the Bible says, Your gateways, your walls shall be your salvation and your gateways praise. And also it talks about, uh, in Isaiah, I have placed watchmen upon your walls. And they would give God no rest and give themselves no rest till they saw what God was doing uh, and established Jerusalem as the praise of the earth. But if you had no walls, you had no intercessors. Because they were the ones who were up there reminding God of what he said, but also saw the dawning of a new day. Even in, the mar even in the darkest night, they knew there was a new day coming. And uh, I want to encourage you today to rebuild your walls. And Nehemiah knew how important walls were to him because he lived in a pagan culture. He lived in a, in a culture that had a pluralistic god worship thing. And he lived among the opulent. I mean, he's, in the, he's the king's cupbearer. So he's living... And he's working with marble pillars, the finest garments, the best diets, all the nobility. And yet, he had a wall around his heart that none of that could touch him. His heart belonged to someone else and somewhere else. And I'm 70 years of age now, and I tell you what, the older you get, the more, the more you want your comfort. Anybody talking about that? Anybody agree? But I've got to make sure that I build a wall around my heart and not go on past experiences, but to find God today. And I want to keep my heart pure. I want to keep my fire and my passion. i got to work at it like you've got to work at it. <clears throat> Some time ago, someone gave me a subscription to uh, a streaming platform. I could watch movies. And I had it for about three or four days, and I thought, there is some stuff on there that's a temptation to me. So I gave it back to them because I don't want to let my wall down. I don't want to allow because the whole purpose of the wall was to stop the pagan influences coming in and bringing their words. Like when you get through the book of Nehemiah, the Sabbath day was to remain holy to God and there was to be no trading. But outside the walls, there was even traders coming, trying to get in. And I want to say to you, you've got to build your walls. And I'm scared because sometimes I think so much of that stuff that's in our society, that's on our televisions, we've got to watch our hearts. If a tradesman came into my house, I would not tolerate it if he used foul language. I said, sorry, I'm an upset with even some Christians, and I said, don't use those kind of words in my presences. I don't want to know. There were kind of words that I used to use before I came to Christ. So let me say, Daniel... Even before I knew him as my father and Christ as the Savior, God has a hand on my life, like you sang this morning. Even before I knew him as father, the Bible says my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the creation of the world. And I'm not a Christian by accident. I'm a Christian because God chose me and I accept it. Both work together. And so I want to say today, and I'm, I'm, I know you think I'm an old fogey, but I am really bothered about some of the stuff that some younger people watch on television. It's no good saying, oh, it's only a movie. It's a practice that's ungodly. It's a language that doesn't build people up. I'm not perfect.
Nehemiah to me is an incredible example that you can outbuild your past. You can outbuild your past. These walls have been knocked down for over a hundred years. And uh, he, being touched by God and a great move of the Spirit of God, is they start to build their way out of their past. They do it brick by brick, stone by stone, drop of sweat by drop of sweat. They start to build this wall. And uh, oh, I'm not going by my, wor- uh, by my slides. I'm like, that doesn't matter, does it? Kathy says it does. Can we have slide three, please? Um, listen, I'll go to this funeral on Tuesday, and I'm, I'm conducting the funeral, and uh, I'm giving the address as well. And one of the things I've learned over the years in funerals, I say something like this. I say, you know what, like I say about Terry Walters, I said, I, when I get to heaven, I'll see Terry. And I'd rather you follow me than him follow me, because I got him for all eternity. <laughs> and he will ask me on that day, did you tell him about Jesus? And I said, that's why I'm talking to you today, about it's a grave error to ignore the resurrection from the dead. And I say to people, listen, I'd rather you fall out with me than he falls out with me. And I'd rather you fall out with me than I fall out with God or he falls out with me. And the same with Kathy. I don't want to fall out with Kathy. <laughs> the person God uses. Let's read these words together, shall we? For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may support those whose heart is completely his. Isn't that great? God is always on the lookout for somebody he wants to use, somebody he can use. God found Abraham in Mesopotamia. God found Jacob between a rock and a hard place. God found Moses in the desert. Jonah found God in the belly of a great fish. Jesus found Peter and John mending their nets. Jesus found Zacchaeus up a tree. Jesus found a lady with the issue of blood in the midst of a crowd. And Jesus found Saul on the road to Damascus. God found Nehemiah in a winter palace. And it wouldn't have mattered where he was, God would have found him. God found me in a council house among thousands of other houses on our large housing estate on the south side of Cork City. Where did he find you? And will he find people here this morning whom he can use? Who will say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Abraham thought he was too old. Jeremiah thought he was too young. Moses thought he was unqualified. Joseph thought he was overqualified. Gideon had an inferiority complex. Jonah had a superiority complex. Complex. Peter was prone to making mistakes. I love him. King David was the runt of the litter. In fact, when the prophet comes, they call all the other sons, but they leave David outside on the field because he was insignificant. But God says in the, in the message translation, he said to Saul, Samuel, go down there to Jesse's house because I've spotted somebody. I've spotted somebody I can use. God was looking. And William Booth said this, I tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, even with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with me and them, on that day, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart and all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life, my word. That makes you sit up and take notice. And I find this challenging. Does God have all the adoration of my heart? Does God have all the power of my will? And does God have all the influence of my life? 
This was a day of divine visitation. Jonathan Edwards, who was greatly used by God in a great awakening in America, he said this. This is going back in the 1700s. He said this. It is a task of every generation to discover which direction God, the sovereign redeemer, is moving and then to move in that direction. The day everything changed. Nehemiah is working away and then he, he meets his brother and somebody else and he, he asks them the question. It's interesting. He's still concerned about God's people. And he's asking questions and he says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Can we have the next slide, please? Anybody tell me what these slides are, who they are, what they are, where they're taken? Mark, who's a treasurer, said if you get this right, he'll give you a thousand pounds. The only qualification, you've you got to be over 95 and not needing glasses. Okay, let me tell. If you go on the, okay, here's, this is, this is a modern day Moses here, okay? And one day he's out there, which was I think about 14, I think it's about 14,600 days after the last time we know God spoke to him. I'm not saying God didn't speak to him in that 40 year period, but this is the first time we have him encountering God in over 40, day, uh, 40 years. 14,600, that's a long time, isn't it? Even if you say it quickly, it's a long time. But one day he's out doing his stuff. Just an ordinary day, a normal day. The birds are still singing. The bushes are there. He gets up. I don't know if he trimmed his beard. He had his cornflakes or his Redipix or his porridge. Nothing different. Then one day, he's going down this route. He'd been down several times. And he sees this bush burning. And I love it. The Bible says this. When God saw that Moses had stopped to look around, it was then God spoke to him. I love that. Because it speaks, God is getting our attention, but Moses stops and turns around and looks at the bush. That was the day everything changed for Moses. Life took on a whole different trajectory than what he thought it would be. The day changed. This guy here is a guy called Richard Simons. I want to read um, a little bit about him. Anybody ever heard of him? This guy on the, the right here? Okay. In 1957, and this book is called David Wilkinson, written by his son. Someone gave me this book in Ireland. Sometimes you think, why has God put this book across my path? Well, he stirred me. The chapter is, God makes a way for a praying person. In 1957, something unusual began to happen to a young man named Dick Simons. He had just gradu graduated from Bible college and he went to be the pastor of Brooklyn Presbyterian Church in New York. It says this, on Mo okay, the congregation had dwindled from 1,400 over a period of time to less than 100 and some of the parishioners had to have a police escort to go to church. It was so bad. Lots of gang crime around where, where, where they were. On most days, Reverend Dick Simon had the church to himself. One morning, as he made his way up the sidewalk, he saw a police vehicle parked in front of the church building with two young men being loaded onto stretchers. He saw blood coursing from their midsections. He later learned that one of the teenagers had been on his way to see him, desperate to talk to a preacher but the boy had been intercepted on the steps of the church manse by the other young man, a rival gang member. The sight of two bleeding, semi-unconscious boys sent Dick to his knees. He spent the entire morning in the living room of the manse praying, God, how long will you send revival to change this? He goes on to say, it provoked me to begin getting up very early in the morning and going to church to pray. Dick says, the Spirit of God came on me, and I found myself praying all day long. Eight 
10, even 16 hours. The fire of God would fall on me and I couldn't stop. My whole body was engaged until I was perspiring. I would get up to pour myself a cup of tea and the Spirit would pull me back into prayer. And he starts to pray with a cross on all these flats and tenement buildings and God would send revival, unknown to him that an eight hour, an eight hour drive away up into Virginia, God would speak to a Pentecostal pastor named David Wilkinson and it would change his life forever. He sold his television and began to pray. Didn't know what he was praying for. He began to pray. And to cut a long story short, David Wilkinson was stirred by the Spirit of God to go to New York, and that's where King Challenge began. But it began because a man named Dick Simons had a day when everything changed. His values changed. His hobbies changed. And he allowed himself to be burdened by God. And I tell you, my word, how the church in our country needs a day of change. Not being a racist here, but it's so difficult to get white people to pray. Trying to go to a good lively prayer meeting, it's the Africans who know how to pray with passion. They hold to God. In fact, most of the great prayer, prayer gatherings around this country, all night prayer meetings, are held by African people. God help us again. I tell you what, if we're going to follow Christ, we've got to lay down our lives. And it's not for me to tell you what to do, but listen, we've got to find out what the sovereign redeemer is doing in our generation and then give ourselves. You know, I was involved in Nice of Prayer in Nottingham when I was much younger. Trying to do it now, it nearly killed me. But since I read this, it's, I've, I've changed my life a bit. I'm an early morning riser, but I tell you what, I've got up a little bit earlier. Kathy will tell you that. Because I want God in my day and generation, however long I've got left in my tank, I want to have that kind of fire. Anybody here this morning? How long have I got, Pastor? How much longer you got? Oh, I, I, I can go all day. Don't ask me. That's dangerous. <laughs> Do not listen. You're in charge. You tell me. I can come back some other time <laughs> when everybody's out. <laughs> I've got five minutes. Thank you. Have I? Okay. <sighs> My wife is always right. <laughs> when I was praying over 47 years ago, did I meet Mrs. Wright? I didn't know her first name was always. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, darling. <laughs> so, I'm going to finish here. No, go back to the, the clock, please. Oh, that the Lord would put, put the clocks to stand still here this morning, but that's not going to happen. This is a clock on Parker Street, which is the main street in, in my home city of Cork. And just to the, as you look at it, just to, just down this way from the clock, there's a, there's a number three bus stop, which goes to the suburb called Ballyfehan and out towards that area. And standing there by the bus stop, 1973, and a guy called Josie Heffernan came to me. I knew Josie by then, because we grew up in the same housing estate. He was a plaster by trade and was plastered every weekend as well, but he'd met Jesus. And I had never met anyone in my life who talked about the Lord Jesus Christ in a real way. And he told me, he said, Jack, I was in those days. Listen, just to clarify something, I was christened John, but I was nicknamed Jack. Because my dad's name was John. And going back all those centuries ago, Jack and John were kind of synonymous for each other. So I tell people, I haven't chose, changed my name. I'm using the name that God gave my parents to give me. So Josie said to me, Jack, I met Jesus. I just laughed. But what I didn't know was he was sowing the word of God inside of me. And God took that word, and after two or three months, I got saved. And I'm changed, and I haven't met Christians, but I'm different. I'm different. I'm not effing and blinding anymore. In fact, the following morning, having knelt by the side of my bed, I got up out of bed playing football, forgot what happened the night before, got fell on a concrete road, never swore, couldn't believe my ears. And it wasn't I'm trying to be different, but God, I was born from above in a matter of a second. Never the same again. And that's why I can't stand that kind of language anymore. God delivered me. Amen. So when my father died some years ago, 
the children, we were in, up in the Midlands of Ireland, the children were in Nottingham. So we, the children came over for my father's funeral, and I took them to there. And I said, children, that's where our life changed. That's where God, through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus, got hold of me and changed our life forever. Now I've got to finish. I want to finish with the verse I never said at the beginning. I'm very still at the moment from Ruth chapter 1. And uh, Naomi, it says about them that when they had heard that God had come to the aid of his people, they set out to go back home. They're going back to Bethlehem, which is called the house of bread. That's what it means, the house of bread. They've been living 10 years away in a foreign land. And it wasn't her fault, it was her husband's fault. And they come back and they come at the beginning of the barley harvest and you know what? My, my, kind of, my kind of imagination, they could smell the fresh bread. And I want to say to you as a church today and to the church across the country, God has come to our aid. Just like he came to those people, Nehemiah's people in Jerusalem, over a hundred years of living with broken down walls and damaged gates and dis disenchanted, no hope, etc. But God send somebody who carries something of the fire of God. And may we here today as Sherwood, currently still called Sherwood Forest Community Church, or is it called Passion? Yeah. Passion Church, bear with me. May God, may God do a sovereign work in our midst. Because if we catch on fire, people will come and watch us burn. <coughs> and I want to ask you today, and I want to say to you today, today is a day when everything can change. Daniel referenced two disciples walking away from Jerusalem, discouraged, despondent, but Jesus came and drew near. Or opened up the scriptures to them and, it, and they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And then it says that the NIV says, within the hour, within the hour, they turned to go back to Jerusalem and to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and to, to, to be with the others. And today is a moment of change it's a moment of opportunity. Just like Nehemiah, it's a moment where God can put something in your heart. Will you stand with me this morning? And will you say to God, you do your business. Lord, I want to be one of those people. Use me. Revive me. Habakkuk prayed, oh God, revive your work in the midst of the year. If you can hold your hands out or up before the Lord as we pray. I pray, Lord, the Bible says about your servant David, whom you found. It says he served the purposes of God for his generation. And we stand before you today, young, middle-aged, old, elderly. And I pray that in all our hearts today, no matter what walls are broken down, I pray in Jesus' name that we here in this church, that Lord, you would work out your purposes in this area through us. I pray, Lord, in our walk with you, that, that fire and compassion that Nehemiah had, that nothing could extinguish. Lord, would you touch us again? Revive us, O oh God, that we, your people, may once again rejoice in you. And I pray today, Father, for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit a fresh outpouring upon us that wherever we go, we will bring something of the fire of God to people. They may recognize something about God in us. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. No, don't, no, no, no.
Lord Jesus, worship Him. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Church, we lift up a shout of praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are holy. Jesus, Jesus, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all, Lord. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy, Lord. What a great word. What a great time in God's presence. What a great worship set. Fantastic worship team. We do appreciate it. To bring it into that place. To bring us into that place and to stir us. Lord, I just love you so much. I just thank you for your word this morning. Pray that it will resonate within us as we chew on it. We can build on it. Work through it, Lord God. We are such an important word for our times and our day and this moment. I just want to give the opportunity to people to right where they are to just reach out to God and respond to that to understand what God's saying receive his spirit receive his love and that love generate faith and hope to come in this day in this day this is our time this is our moment I believe God is wanting us to embrace it. To embrace it. Walk with it and carry it. Question God's asked this morning, I believe, of everybody, and I count myself in this, is does God have the adoration? All the adoration of my heart. I think that's a key question to keep coming back to as we grow and we move in the things of the kingdom of God. You know, we don't need to be washed all over, but we need to keep our feet washed. The stuff that we pick up during the day and the week. And something else I've written down and maybe just where I am right now. But it's a task of every generation to find the direction God wants them to go and to move in it. And I believe we're moving in the things of the kingdom of God in this place. We're moving in the things of the kingdom of God, where God wants to take us. The barren times are no longer there for the things of the kingdom of God, the harvest, the praise, and the move of his spirit in our lives to see his kingdom come and his will be done in this place, in our lives, in this community, and I believe in our nation will be stirred for the things of of the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you, John. And just for clarification, I want to emphasize in case people didn't realize it was his wife that spoke about how much time he'd got left. Because I didn't know what to say. <laughs> um, but John, thank you for that word. And I want to encourage you that it will be up on uh, our YouTube channel later on today or maybe tomorrow morning. Um, but I encourage you to watch it back I think John brought a great word in season in a time that we're moving in right now as a church and a group of people to move in his spirit in Jesus name tea and coffee afterwards stay join us time to chat about the word anybody who's feeling they need to talk about other issues we're we're around to talk about those and be with you, stand with you and share with you at this time. But I want to say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and for all eternity. That the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And I believe this blessing at this time is even more important than ever. That ye we know his peace and his grace abound in every moment and every time. In Jesus' name. Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.